Thanks, everybody. Sorry for the uh, little interruption there. That was exciting. Um, did you just hear me? Can you turn off over the alarm on the Anyway, this is number three in our lecture, Lunch and Learn series this month. And we'll be back again Thanks. in two weeks. And today, Aaron's going to tell us all about different light sources and all the other little fish. Yes, so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about different ways to illuminate your sample. And I'll mention different kinds of you know, lamps versus lasers. But the main theme and topic that I want to bring across to you is that regardless of your light source, you can use different elements like lenses to illuminate your sample in whatever way you want. And of course, there are sometimes optimal uh, illumination methods, uh, optimal light sources for a particular illumination method. Um, but in general, we can think about some sort of common rules that allow us to think about how a particular illumination patterns on our sample. So I'm going to talk about these different illumination methods in the context of ray optics. So we can use rays to describe the way that light moves. And this doesn't describe everything about light. Things like wave optics and polarization are needed to completely describe the behavior of light. Um, but with Ray optics, we're going to get pretty close to understanding things like image formation and how light is either focused or collimated at different points in our life path. And so the, the thing that we'll need to remember when thinking about ray optics and the way that lenses, which are made of glass, move our light in different ways is uh, information about refractive index and Snell's law. So we talked a couple weeks ago about refractive index, that each material has a refractive index that describes um, how fast light moves through that medium in comparison to the speed of light in a vacuum. And so typically a material will slow light down and so it will have a refractive index of slightly higher than one. Um, and so for example, a glass would have a higher refractive index than uh, air, than if that light was traveling through air. And we can calculate how much light will bend as it refracts, as it moves from uh, a medium of a given uh, refractive index to a different medium with a different refractive index. Um, and we can calculate this using Snell's law. So we take the refractive index of each of those materials and the angle relative to the normal that uh, that light is traveling at um, will be either N1 in the first material or N2 in the second, uh, sorry, uh, sine of beta 1 in the first material, sine of beta 2 in the second material. And um, so how we're going to explore this is in this great little simulator um, that's available on GitHub, if any of you want to uh, try it out after the lecture or as you sort of think about these concepts. And I don't know who Rick 2 is, so I tried to find out who this person was. I don't know if this person created this simulator just for fun or for a course, um, but I really love it. There are other ones out there, but this one I, I really enjoy. And because it's on GitHub and open source, um, there are a few points where uh, there are things that are missing from it and interesting features that you could add. So if anyone is really into coding, um, feel free to improve this simulator. Um, and so hopefully this is okay. It's gonna take a second, it always takes a second to end the show, get out of PowerPoint and get to the browser. But um, I'm hoping that this will be sort of a nice way to illustrate some of these concepts. Okay, so um, when we use right optics, we describe um, let's imagine this point being some you know, luminescent point of light, so a very, very small jellyfish, for example, um, and it's sending light out in all directions, and so we can describe those with these rays. And with this simulator, I can change the ray density, so if I wanted to make it really high, then we just see this sort of shading effect, but if I make it low, I can, I can see individual rays of light. Um, and this simulator also allows me to place my optical axis here. So I just put a ruler in a straight line, um, and then I can place a lens. And this is a positive lens, and uh, so we can move this source of light and these uh, diverging rays from this source and see where they converge on the other side of this positive lens. And there's um, three rays that you can draw to always find where this point converges on the other side of this lens. Um, and so hopefully, I can zoom in a little bit, but hopefully it's um, clear. Uh, the first is that if a, oh, and the other important thing to say is that I can define the focal length of this lens. So I just put it in as 100 of these arbitrary units. Um, 
you can calculate the focal length of any given lens um, using the lens maker's equation, um, and it, it relates the um, refractive index of that lens to the radii curvature of that lens. Um, but here I just put it in the simulation that this lens has a refractive index of 100. And so, I'm sorry, it has a, has a focal length of 100. And so, if I place this point at any given spot, um, the first thing that is true is that rays, oops, sorry, rays that um, enter um, parallel to the optical axis will go through the focal point on the other side of the lens. And so this is also true in the reverse. If a ray comes out parallel on this side, it will go through the focal point on this side, or you could say the opposite, that if something goes through the focal point on this side, it's going to come out parallel to the optical axis on this side. And the final rule is that any ray going through the center of the lens will not be bent. Um, it will be bent by the lens, but it will be bent back as it is next to the lens. So if you're thinking about before and after the lens, it goes through the straight. Um, and using those three rays, you can find where these rays that are diverging on this side of the lens, where they come <coughs> over here. And then I can move this point um, closer to or further away from the focal point. So um, remember the focal point is here on this lens because I defined it to be there. And um, note where this second point is um, in relation to the optical axis. So as I move this point um, only in the x direction, you can see that this point also moves in the x direction, um, but it also gets further away from the optical axis. And so that's indicating uh, if, if you had a point, uh, let's say this was the top of an arrow, is how people frequently draw it, then the top of that arrow would be getting further and further down here, meaning that that arrow would look larger on the other side of the lens. Um, and something interesting happens. Uh, remember the rule that things uh, going through the focal point will come out uh, parallel to the optical axis. So if I get this closer and closer to the focal point, you can see that now on the other side, these rays no longer converge, and I have all of these parallel rays of light. And then if I go beyond that point, then they are diverging on the other side of the lens. And so this is the first key takeaway that I want you to um, think about and have in your mind. Um, is that things that are focused on one side of the lens, if they're sitting at the focal point, then they come out as these collimated parallel rays um, on the other side of the lens. And if I move this up and down, what you can see is that I still get parallel rays, but they're at a different angle. So the other thing to think about is that position on this side of the lens at that uh, focal point um, is converted to an angle on the other side of the lens in that column. Um, and so you could think about it in the reverse. If I could move this angle, if maybe my light isn't coming from this direction, but instead it's coming from over here, and I want to focus it to a point, um, changing this angle of that beam would change the position of that point. And I can't change these angles in this simulation, but what I can do is instead uh, put a beam here instead of a point source. And I can place this beam here, and you can see that I've created a point um, on the other side of the lens. And if I change the angle, then I'm changing the position of that point. Um, and so hopefully this is already starting to get you to think about point scanning, wide field illumination, the sort of differences. And um, if not, that's okay, we'll get to that in a second. Um, but the, the couple of rules I want you to keep in mind is the focusing to a point on one end and having uh, parallel rays on the other, and that there's some relationship between the position of this point and the angle of those rays of light, right? Okay, great. So let's go back to our point source. Put it at our focal point here. <coughs> so put it at our focal point. And um, the other thing that we can think about is that this isn't just a one step process. You could do this over and over again. So I've drawn one lens here. 
Um, but if I take uh, under this glasses tab, you can um, add another lens. And so I can put a lens here. I can put a lens here. But it has to be at the focal point. This convergence of these rays has to be at the focal point, and then I will get parallel rays on the other on the other end. So I could put an infinite number of lenses here, and at least in the simulation, do this forever. And the idea is still that these the parallel rays um, will then converge to a point. And if this next lens is at a focal distance away from this point, then I will get parallel rays on the other end. So we can just do this over and over and over. And so the other thing that I want you to think about is that in a microscope, um, let's draw one more of these. In a microscope, you could have a series of these lenses, and there would be points on either side of these lenses where you had conjugate planes. So let's say this is our very small jellyfish that we're imaging. Um, and at this point, we have uh, parallel rays of light, so we're not getting an image of this, but here at this point, when they converge to that point again, we get an image of whatever our, our sample was. And then here again, we get another image. And so you have these conjugated planes that sort of contain the same information. The information is actually there sort of throughout the system, but if you wanted to form an image, you could do that at each of these points. And so that's important to think about as we um, build a, a slightly more complicated system and maybe overlay multiple different light paths in one is to think about where you have the same, say, image um, throughout your system. Okay, so um, I'm gonna delete some of these elements and then instead of talking about our very small jellyfish, um, one thing that I want you to think about is that this is not really indicative, we're supposed to be talking about illumination, we're talking about light sources. Um, this is not really what a light source looks like if we have, say, a lamp there would be many, many point sources on that lamp, right? And that light would be going in many different directions. Um, and so if we want to make ourselves slightly more accurate, um, let's draw a few more point sources on here. So now we have three point sources. And what you can see is what I already showed you, that if these points are still at the focal plane, then we still get parallel rays of light, but they're going in different directions. And so you could imagine that because these aren't ever coming to a focus, we're not getting, a, this is a light filament, we're not getting an image of the filament over here. These are all just parallel rays of light. Um, if we put a sample here, we would have nice, even illumination of that sample. We wouldn't have some pattern illumination from the filament of the lamp, for example, this is a type of example of nice, um, even illumination. And so we're going to take that principle to um, build sort of a transmitted light microscope. And I'm not going to do this from scratch. I'm just going to go into my next tab here. Where, um, we've gotten somewhat close to that idea. So it, are these sort of basic principles? Okay, so okay, cool. So um, here we've added a few more lens elements. I still have my three point sources. So this is you know my lamp or something. Um, and then I have a lens here. And these points are one full distance away. And so here I have uh, parallel rays of light. But then I put another lens, and now I have an image. Let's imagine my filament. I, I uh, refocus this light, and so now I have an image of my filament, and I put another lens, and then there are parallel rays of light again. OK, so this is great. And, and we talked about how right here, we might have very nice illumination. We wouldn't want to put a sample here because we'd be imaging it with sort of a pattern of the, the light that we used. Um, but here it might be a good spot because we have nice even illumination um, and it's not focused light. And so if we put our sample here, I would drawn this separately. Um, one thing this uh, demo does not have is the ability to make these rays different colors. Um, so if anyone wants to add that as a feature, that would be very cool. It would be a very simple change. Um, but you, so you can imagine overlaying these to make it a little bit more clear. But uh, we're just going to align them, and these are actually overlapping, but we're going to draw them separately. So imagine that I put my sample here, where I said we might have nice even illumination, and there's some light rays that are you know, emanating from my sample. So maybe they've been refracted or diffracted by my sample, and so they're, they're being sent in some different directions than what I've drawn here. And so they'll be diverging. And um, if I put them, uh, at the focal plane of my uh, objective lens, 
So now we can name this lens. We can say this is probably our objective lens. Then they're going to come out parallel on the other <coughs> side, right? Just like the rules we said before. And then yet again, we put another lens here, and that's going to focus to a point. And so if we put a camera here, or if we put our eyes here, then we would see an image of our sample, but we would not see an image of our filament. And I keep saying filament, but any light source, pick your poison. Um, we wouldn't see an image of our light source. We would only see an image of what we want to see an image of, which is our sample. So does that make sense that we have two sort of overlapping light paths? And those conjugate planes that I talked about, the planes where we have an image here, or actually a sample here, and an image here, are different than in this path where we have a, a sample or a light source here and an image here. They're at different points. Okay, cool. So um, we're going to take that knowledge and go back to our PowerPoint where we have an actual image of uh, what we call curler illumination, where we have these lenses aligned appropriately. Um, I'm sorry, it takes almost a second to. And so I've um, placed my drawing, I've just turned it on its head. So this is our source here, and this is our sample here. And I've tried to align it with this nice, you know, more detailed diagram, uh, where we see that things are a little bit more complicated than I described. Um, for example, your objective lens is not one lens, but many lenses. Um, and the point where I've drawn our light source in this diagram is actually just an image of our light source. Our light source is down here, and by these same rules, it's been you know, focused to a point here so we can see our, an image of our light source here, um, but actually our light source is not ending from this point, but somewhere down here. But the, the same rules apply, and what you can see is that based on these red and yellow drawings, what they're showing is the same thing I described, that here my specimen is in focus, and I can get an image of my specimen at these points here. Either it's focused here to go to your eyes or maybe focused here to go to a camera. Um, and similarly, there are places where I could see an image of my light source. Um, so here they're drawing a nice filament. Um, and it is in focus, importantly, at different points in my light path. Because when I take an image, I don't want to see this nice specimen plus a squiggly line over top. I just want to see the specimen. Okay, so we have um, similarly three points where this is in focus, is uh, an image, um, but that's not where we're gonna place, say, our camera. But at these different points, we can do different manipulations and it will affect the resultant image that we get in different ways. So one option, and I think sort of the easier of the two to understand, is at this point here, and at this point here, there are these Diagram, so these little apertures that you can open and close, okay? And here is where when we see these as a point, that means we have um, an image of, uh, of, our, of our specimen, although our specimen is above it, but this is where our, the light that is illuminating our specimen uh, is, is in focus. So this would be a conjugate plane with our specimen. Um, and so what that means is that if I were to close that aperture, you would see the edges of that aperture as you close it, you would see it in focus in your image because this point is conjugate to this point is conjugate to the point where I'm taking an image. And so just like I see my specimen in focus, I would see the edges of that circle closing, closing and opening. Does that, does that make sense? And so what that means is that closing and opening this uh, aperture will change the size of my field of view. So if this was my specimen, I could open it up and see a big black circle with this little specimen inside, or I could close it down and just see the specimen and, and not be illuminating um, the other parts of my specimen, the other, not parts of my specimen, the other parts of my specimen. Does that make sense? Okay, so the other uh, aperture that we can change is this one here. Mm -hmm. And this one is next to the lens that we haven't named yet. So we named our objective. And here, this is your condenser. So whether you're using an upright or inverted microscope, this is the lens that's on the other side uh, that the objectives are not on. And maybe it's one that you never touch because you're not really quite sure what it does. Uh, when we're doing fluorescence microscopy, sometimes we forget about the condenser. Um, but this is your condenser lens. And this aperture diaphragm 
changes what part of this filament, if we were taking an image of the filament, we would see the edges of that aperture opening and closing. And so what does that mean? Other than you know, sending more or less light in, why is the size of that aperture important? And why is, similarly, the relative positions of all of these lenses important? Because, of course, these, we saw how moving these lenses um, or moving our sample made a difference as far as whether it was a collimated beam on the other end, whether it was uh, converging uh, to a point on the other end. And so these positions and the opening of this aperture diaphragm, why is that important? And so to illustrate that, um, I'm going to simplify our light path a little bit again. Um, but we still have our condenser lens and our objective lens. Then we have our light source. Okay, so um, let's say our sample is some diffraction grating. And the idea here, if you've ever shown, I wish I had one, but if you, you know, shine a laser point through a diffraction grating, you get, uh, you know, one beam goes in and you get these other beams coming out, right? Um, and so we're still gonna draw this like ray optics, but to describe this, you uh, really would wanna use wave optics to describe this pattern that you see. But uh, we're gonna use uh, just rays in this, in this diagram. So if we have our light source that is sending out some diverging rays of light that we saw before. It's at an appropriate position relative to our condenser such that we get parallel rays of light on the other end, but it hits this diffraction grating and uh, we get new beams of light. And so um, what we see here is we have this central uh, non-diffracted beam and then we get this uh, plus one and minus one diffracted beam. And the angle at which they are diffracted relative to this central beam, um, we can define based on D being the spacing of this diffraction grating, um, sine of this angle is equal to the wavelength. And so that's why we drew these lines here and not here, for example, okay? Um, and the point is that in this scenario, our objective lens is capturing those <coughs> rays, right? Those diffracted um, but what if we made this D distance smaller? So you can see that my sample here is uh, the diffraction grating is a bit more fine. So we illuminate it in the same way, but now because this D has gotten smaller, then this angle has gotten larger. And now what we want is these rays to converge like they are doing here. But um, in fact, we're missing, we're not capturing those rays. That's why I've colored them red. You can see that they are wider than your objective lens. And this is, when we talk about the numerical aperture of a lens, we're always talking about that half angle of the cone of light that that objective lens can uh, collect. And, and this is exactly what we're talking about, sort of how far can those diffracted beams be apart so that the objective lens can still collect them. Okay, so this seems like a problem. So we can't see this specimen. We can't see that, that fine of, of a grading. But, Remember that we're not just illuminating from this point, we're also illuminating from other points on this filament. And those different positions will convert to different angles of parallel light on parallel rays on the other side of the condenser lens. So here I'm illuminating from a different point, and so now these rays are off axis. They're, they're at a different angle, right? And so now um, our central non-diffracted beam is here, so it's not straight up and down like we saw before. And this angle is the same as it was before, but if we actually take the angle from the normal, from you know, parallel to the optical axis, this angle plus this angle of how that light was going in sum up to create the original theta that we saw before. Does that make sense? And this angle from the normal is actually smaller than this angle here, which is why you can see in this example, it's still being collected by the objective lens. So, okay, who cares? Um, the reason we care is because, like I said, this theta and this theta add up to be this original angle, right? And so now we have this d sine theta in plus sine theta out equals our wavelength. Um, and in this scenario, remember that these angles can be as big as that half angle that that objective lens could collect. 
So when we define our numerical aperture, we're describing the half angle of the cone of light that that objective can collect. And this, let's call it alpha, is the same regardless of whether we illuminated off axis or on axis. And so because we've made the angle from the normal smaller, we can now collect this light, right? And so now what this means is that maximally each of these could be equal to alpha. And so we say that uh, d times 2 sine alpha is equal to the wavelength. And this is how, when we define our resolution as this, um, the smallest distance d that we're able to resolve, there's this number 2, dividing that in half, making your resolution double. Um, that is from this off-axis illumination. So having all of your lenses aligned appropriately and getting all of the off-axis illumination possible is what effectively doubles your resolution is having proper uh, illumination. And so when you align your microscope, when you align it for chrono illumination, it's important to have your condenser and your objective in the appropriate position. Now, typically your objective is always in the right position because you want your sample to be in focus. That's pretty hard to tell if you've done that wrong. But um, there are also ways where you can determine whether your condenser lens is in the appropriate position. And, um, there are great YouTube videos on this, um, but also stop by the facility and we can talk about how to curl your microscope whenever you want. Um, the other thing that is important is in order for this to be true, um, the fact that you know, these angles can both be maximally alpha, that means that the NA of your condenser and your objective have to be the same. So if, if in fact this NA is smaller, then you don't achieve this 2 sine alpha because uh, that would be this NA is different for that condenser lens. So in order for this to be true, the, the NA is have to be the same. Um, or you just pick whichever NA is high. Is lower, sorry. <laughs> okay, um, so back to our, uh, to our illumination uh, diagram here. And so we've seen why the position of these different lenses <coughs> is important. The fact that we have um, these interesting conjugate planes, ones where we can see the filament and ones where we can see our <coughs> specimen, our sample. Um, and we've seen why those locations are important, but another thing that we can do is we can do funky things to this light path to change how we illuminate it. So in the slide before, I showed you why optimally illuminating it is important, but in some cases, you might want to illuminate it slightly differently because optimal means something different in different contexts. And so the um, example I want to show you is uh, the same system I showed before, um, but Hopefully you'll notice that my sample is now a lighter green. Um, and this is very important to say that uh, maybe this sample is sort of low contrast. Um, and so in this scenario, uh, maybe your transmitted light right field image, uh, you don't really see much. It's, it's very low contrast. And so uh, one thing that you can do is you have your condenser and your objective lens still at their appropriate positions, but you put a block over the center of your light source. And the reason you do that is because then you only get these side points of illumination, this high angle illumination. And this illumination is so high angle that it actually misses your objective lens. So another thing to notice is that this objective lens is narrower than my condenser lens. And I'm using that to indicate that this objective lens has a lower numerical aperture than the condenser. So it's collecting a smaller angle of light than my condenser is sending into my sample. Um, and so these totally miss the objective. So you would see a totally dark image. Unless, let's go down just to one of these for simplicity. Unless uh, that light is changed by my sample, sent off in another direction by my sample. And in that case, you can see that some of these beams are being collected by the objective lens. And so the only way you see something in your image, other than a totally black image, is if light is sent off in another direction by your sample. And this technique is called dark field. And um, these are just some examples uh, from the internet, from great resource, I think I mentioned many times before, but um, there are these great series of articles on, on literally any microscopy topic um, you might be interested in, or you can find nice sample images of uh, different techniques. 
And so um, this might be a sample that's relatively low contrast in bright field, but when you look at it under dark field illumination, uh, you see uh, more interesting features of this sample. And uh, same here, you can sort of see something that actually is sort of high contrast in some ways, but some of this finer structure is not, and so you can maybe see that instead. Okay, so for the most part, I've focused on, uh, in, in this first part, on transmitted light techniques. The idea that you're sending light into your sample through your light path, and you're collecting whatever light is transmitted. But when we think about fluorescence microscopy, which I know many people in this room are doing, um, it's slightly different, right? Because you send in some excitation light, but you don't ever plan on hopefully collecting that excitation light. You plan on collecting the emitted light that's being emitted from your dyes or fluorescent molecules in your sample. And so some of these things we think about a little bit differently. Um, and so I wanted to take this point to talk about some of the different light sources that you might use. Um, and, and yet, I want to be clear that you know some of these light sources could still be used and are used for transmitted light techniques. Um, but for now, I'll discuss them in the context of, of fluorescent microscopy. So, um, the first, oh, and the other thing I wanted to say is that I think generally the biggest difference, um, the two fields that we can talk about when we think about fluorescence microscopy, and just to keep this as like a framework in your head, is the difference between, say, wide field microscopy where we're illuminating our whole sample and a point scanning kind of microscopy where we're taking a point, it's a focus point of light, and we're scanning that across our sample. And so um, if you haven't done these, don't worry, we're, we're going to talk about them more. But if you have done these, keep this as sort of a framework in your mind of, of thinking about wide field versus uh, point scanning microscopy. And I think typically we think about wide field illumination as coming from a lamp and as uh, and point scanning microscopy is coming from a laser. And that might very well be true in the majority of cases that, that you do have wide field illumination coming from a lamp and a point scanning source coming from a laser. But um, again, the, the idea of this lecture is I want to talk about how you could get a point onto your sample or how you could get <coughs> a collimated beam of light onto your sample regardless of the source. So there still might be ideal methods, ideal sources to use for different illumination patterns, but um, uh, we'll hopefully see that it doesn't matter so much what your source is and you can sort of play some interesting tricks um, to, to get the kind of information you want. Okay, so if we're in the, in the realm of uh, lamps to start with, um, I'm just showing here uh, different light sources that are different uh, colors here and uh, what's being plotted is the um, spectral intensity across different wavelengths. So how bright is that source across different wavelengths? And um, just to take you through a couple of them, uh, this tungsten halogen source is uh, something that you might find in a, a bright field transmitted light setup. It might be found in a teaching microscope and a teaching lab. Um, and I think also you can still find them in your car's headlights. Um, and these are your incandescent bulbs that you know many countries are banning because they're not very efficient. And uh, this is what we can use to do those bright field techniques that we talked about before. Um, and you can see that they're, they have some, uh, some spectral intensity across the wavelengths that we're interested in. No big peaks at various points, but definitely differentially uh, efficient at, at different wavelengths. Um, and you can also see that they're much dimmer than other kinds of light sources, such as a mercury arc lamp that's plotted in red. Um, and the difference that uh, you should also note in this tungsten halogen bulb versus these arc lamps is that these arc lamps have uh, very defined spectral peaks. So certain uh, parts of the visible spectrum where you get uh, a lot of light output and then some parts where you get very little light output. And so you can see this as an advantage or a disadvantage. So it could be a disadvantage if you want nice, even spectral illumination, but if you designed your fluorophores so that they were optimally excited by any of these numbers, um, then that would be fine. And that is what has happened in, in some cases where fluorophores are designed, dyes are designed, so that they're optimally excited by these kinds of uh, wavelengths. And so you put some filter in front of it to just get this peak or just get this peak, for example. Um, but an alternative to doing this is uh, what's shown on the right, which uh, is a sampling of different LEDs, light emitting diodes, that have 
um, fairly narrow um, spectral peaks. Um, and each of these is a different LED. So you don't have this entire peak spectrum, but for a given LED, you have you know, one of these colors or wavelengths of light. And for a long time, this was not really a viable option for imaging because uh, these LEDs were just nowhere near as bright as uh, something like an arc lamp. Uh, but nowadays, they're very bright. And uh, I like this plot that shows um, the increasing flux across time and the decrease in cost over time. And, and with that, um, these have been, uh, become uh, much more reasonable for uh, fluorescence microscopy. And um, I already sort of mentioned the fact that there are many of these that have different spectral peaks. Um, and, and just to plot a few more here and, and illustrate that as we develop these LEDs, um, we have more flexibility as far as where that peak is. So you can dope your silicon semiconductor lattice with different elements, uh, typically group three and group five elements, that change what this peak wavelength is. And um, in doing so, we now have uh, imaging setups that have a spectrally narrow um, light source and we have many of them, so we have sort of a library of options for, for what we excite our sample with. And so this is really good as we also see an explosion of development in uh, many different dyes and proteins that we're able to use in our sample. And this gives us all that flexibility to actually eliminate those, those fluorescent dyes um, appropriately. Um, and speaking of spectrally narrow, um, this doesn't quite compare to what we see with laser illumination. So um, with lasers, you know, we're not really showing spectra, we're showing these lines um, where individual laser lines will, will excite a uh, very precise wavelength of light. And you know, this is a great thing if you want uh, specificity. We talked two weeks ago about separating many different fluorescent dyes or proteins. Um, if you can accurately um, or precisely uh, excite a given uh, fluorescent protein or dye, this is really good. But you know, this also excites a wider range of wavelengths, and so sometimes that can also um, and I just wanted to define some terms as we think about, you know, which one of these light sources is better. Because for different contexts, um, a laser could be the best option, and in another context, an LED might be the best option. Um, so first, if we describe uh, the energy of some light source, uh, that light source has some photons in it that, or it's emitting photons that uh, have some energy. And so the energy, the radiant energy of that light source would be the summation of the energy of all of the photons that it was emitting, right? Um, and if we wanted to uh, calculate the radiant flux, that would be the change in that energy over time. Um, but then once we start to describe the radiance of a light source, or even the spectral radiance of a light source, we're not just considering the amount of uh, light or energy that's being output, but um, we have to consider the area, the size of that light source, and how far diverging of an angle that light is being sent in, and also what wavelengths of light. So your units now contain this per area term and per solid angle term, and if you were considering spectral radiance, it would be also per wavelength per lambda. And this matters because if you think about a big light filament versus uh, a tiny aperture in a laser, um, that's much smaller than that big filament. And so because of that difference in size, your laser is inherently going to have a higher radiance. And remember, it has a narrow, a more narrow spectral range. Um, and so it's also going to have intrinsically a higher spectral range. Um, the other thing to consider uh, that also has relations to the size of your source and uh, whether you're a single frequency or, or a band of frequencies is the coherence of that light. And so light emitted from a laser is coherent, but light emitted from a uh, lamp, an um, LED, or uh, a tungsten halogen bulb um, is, is not coherent. And the reason this matters is because with coherent light, we can get uh, an interference pattern uh, that is both visible and constant. And so this becomes important uh, when we think about 
focusing our light to a point. We can focus the light from an LED to a point or focus the light from a tungsten halogen bulb to a point. Um, but if we have coherent waves that can interfere, um, then that will allow us to get the smallest point spread function possible uh, when we want to focus our light to a point for point scanning microscopy. And so we're going to go over the ray tracing diagrams for those, but I, I want you to have these ideas in mind, the idea of spectral radiance um, and coherence as we talk about these different light sources. Okay, so back to our simulation. So here, um, now that we're talking about fluorescence, um, our point source here, think of it as some molecule in our sample that we have excited. We've excited it somehow by putting light in. Um, and it's now emitting light, okay? And so this is the point source. It's emitting light in all directions. And if we put it at the focal point of a lens, then we get nice parallel rays here. And if we put another lens, then we get an image on the other side of that point that was emitting. So this is our sample, our molecule of interest, and now we can see it on this other side, right? Um, and so these would be those conjugate planes here. Um, if you've done confocal microscopy, you typically close down a pinhole. So let's say this is where your detector is. You close down a pinhole before getting to the detector. So why do you do that? Well, if we had multiple point sources, in our sample, so maybe we have one here, we have one here. Um, those are converging to different points. So let's see. So you can see that these are converging. These are converging to different points, which makes sense because they're at different distances from our objective lens. Um, and so we can also put some blockers here in this diagram, and we can block some of this light. Um, on either side, not all of it, on either side, so that we eliminate some of that outer focus light. And as you change the distance between these blockers, um, which are the edges of your pinhole, um, then you can get different amounts of that light blocked, and you can change the thickness of the optical sections that you're taking. So that's uh, essentially what you're doing in a confocal microscope. Let's delete these extra points. We'll go back to our single point. Okay, and so um, again, we have you know, our point source, our collimated uh, beam, and then we have uh, this converging to a point on the other side. So um, we need to get some illumination to this sample in some way um, to excite it. So I've just shown it as emitting light, but of course we have to excite it in order for it to do that. So um, remember we talked about how in fluorescence microscopy, your excitation light is uh, typically separate from your emission light. So it's not transmitted. We're not trying to collect it with uh, in the detector as it's being transmitted through our sample. We just want to send it in to excite our, our molecules and then we want to filter it out uh, and not let it get to our detector. So unfortunately, there's no um, filters in this uh, simulation. Um, but what I can put in is um, just a mirror. So this is a mirror here. And um, Typically, in, in a fluorescence microscope, this would reflect your incoming excitation light. So maybe that was 488 uh, nanometer um, uh, light. And then it would allow your emitted fluorescence light, which would be longer wavelength, to be transmitted through that mirror. That's not going to happen in this simulation, but um, we will allow it to reflect our light here. So um, the first thing we can do, um, sort of simple, is put Instead of a point source, put our beam of light here. And what do we see? We see that we get a point of light on the other side. OK, no surprises. Um, but this is one example of how you could send in some collimated light, maybe from a laser, and you would get it focused to a point. Um, and then you could change the angle of this light, and you could scan that point across your sample. So this is you know, a simplification, but, but at its essence, the way that a point scanning microscope would work, right? You have this light focus to a point, and you can move the angle of that collimated beam, um, and that will move 
Okay, so then what if um, we have, say, oh, actually I want to keep that theme, and let's say instead we want to put another lens, put it here, and now what do we get but a collimated beam of light on the other end. So we've sent in our laser light, our collimated beam of light, and yet we don't get a focus point because we've added in another lens here. We've allowed that light to be focused on this side of our objective lens. And so as it goes in at a focus point one focal distance away, then we get a nice collimated beam on the other side. And so using our laser light or whatever collimated light source, we can either get a focused point on the other end or we can get a collimated beam of light on the other end. And so this would be an example of how you could do, say, laser wide field microscopy. And um, I recognize that I'm getting close to time, so um, you could do the same things with a point of light and, and you'd have the opposite effects. And I have images of those in my PowerPoint, so you can just do it the short way. Um, where in our confocal light microscope or point scanning light microscope, we illuminate with a collimated beam of light and we get a focus point on the other side of our objective lens. Um, and then the alternative is that you start with, in a wide field microscope, you start with a point of light. Remember, it would actually be multiple points of light because you'd have some, it's not truly a point source, um, but some diverging source of light. Um, and then you could get a collimated beam on the other side of your objective. Um, but you don't, starting with the same things, you could still get a different result out the other end with different lens elements, for example. So you could send in some diverging source and uh, you could put a lens here to collimate it and then that collimated light will lead to a point on this other side. And so you could use your LED, for example, or your whatever bulb to get a point on the other end. But remember, it's not really a point, it's an image of whatever your source is over here. If you want to make it a point, then you would have to put, uh, say, an aperture in front of that uh, source and then you know, get a collimated uh, light out the other end. And the reason we don't typically do this with uh, lamps is because they just don't have the output that a laser does already in this uh, nice collimated light source. Um, and contrast is that you could take this collimated beam of light um, and instead of just letting it enter the objective as a collimated beam, you could focus it and then let it go through the objective and then it comes out as a collimated beam. And like I mentioned, this would be a laser uh, wide field um, form of illumination. And so going back to the idea of uh, this spectral radiance and coherence idea, I already sort of mentioned why the radiance of your light source is important. If you tried to take uh, an LED and use it as a point scanner, um, you would be eliminating so much of the light that you wouldn't get enough light to your sample to excite your fluorescent molecules. Um, but a laser, which already has this sort of point source nature um, and has a lot, a lot of photons coming out at that point, um, has enough spectral radiance to, to then be focused to a point and still excite um, your fluorescent molecules. But the coherence is also important and it, um, it describes why, other reasons why these are sort of suboptimal or, or optimal in certain conditions. So remember we want this focus point to be as small as possible and we can't really use uh, ray optics to describe what this point looks like, what our point spread function looks like. We need to use wave optics, but in describing the wave optics uh, uh, definition behind behind this point spread function, we consider the fact that, there, that that light is interfering. And in order for light to interfere and have that constant visible interference pattern, it needs to be coherent. And so this is why we would get a better point of light um, if we were using a laser illumination instead of something like an LED. Um, and then the opposite is true if you're trying to evenly illuminate your whole sample. You don't want interference. You want a perfectly homogeneous, even illumination. And so if you use a laser, you can do this, and we do this, um, but you run the risk that any, any dust or any <coughs> tilt to your cover glass or anything 
um, will create some interference pattern in the way that you eliminate your sample. And so it will no longer look like a perfect even code elimination. One reason you might do this is if you wanted really, really high intensity light at your sample plane. So instead of using an LED, uh, uh, a laser would have much higher spectral radiance. And so if you wanted to do laser wide field, you would get a lot more light to your sample. And so you might do this for something like a uh, single molecule imaging where you really need a lot of light um, being sent to your sample. Okay, and um, I'll just finish with one point that, remember I said you don't want to put uh, the, the image of your bulb on your sample because then you're seeing the bulb and your sample. Well, sometimes maybe you do if you want to image your sample with some interesting pattern. So uh, one example of doing this is you can actually have um, an array of LEDs and you actually want the image of that array of LEDs on your sample um, or whatever pattern you so choose. That gets you this pattern of illumination um, where you have essentially this grid where you have a modulation of the intensity of light that you're using to illuminate your sample. And so this is a method of optical sectioning because anything that's in your focal plane should be modulating with the light intensity, um, but anything that's out of focus should not be modulating. And so you can take a series of images where you move this grid, look for things that are modulating. Um, if you add them all together, you get your original image. And if you want your optically sectioned image, um, you do some subtraction of these uh, images and things that are being modulated will, uh, will still be present and, and that will represent your thin optical section. Um, for those of you who have done some uh, sim imaging on the Elira, um, you might be thinking, well, I see grids on, on my image and I use uh, this pattern to not just get an optical section, but instead you use it to get a higher resolution image. So you take that modulation uh, to try and find some frequencies that are uh, interacting with the frequency that you're illuminating your sample with um, and you use that to calculate a super resolution image. So how does that work? Well, I'm uh, obviously out of time, uh, and that's a good thing because uh, Chris is going to talk about this on August 7th. Um, and the reason he's going to talk about it is not only because he knows a lot about it, but also because we're getting a new microscope, the Elira 7, which will still do SIM, but will do a new kind of SIM called Lattice SIM. Um, it's very exciting, and he will explain all the math behind why illuminating with a grid or other pattern can get you super resolution. So stay tuned for that. Um, but before that, um, and in addition to that, we have two other lectures. And this is exciting because these are two, uh, Dushan and Andrew are, are two guest lecturers. They're both John Harbour Distinguished Science Fellows. Um, and they're running their, their own uh, small groups um, dealing with interesting questions in microscopy. And so they're gonna talk about um, some computational microscopy and also some uh, some analysis methods that we can use for microscopy. So please do come to those guest lectures and definitely come on August 7th for our Elira 7 um, kickoff. So I know that was a lot. Um, I hope you guys do go explore that um, gray optics uh, simulator because I think it's really fun and you can play around with putting different you know, weird things in your light path and see what kind of up the other end. And if you're really good at coding, then um, please add some you know, dichroics and some dispersion and other interesting things. Um, so I think you can make it even uh, more accurate. And I will take a in-person question. But I'm sorry, I know I'm wearing